Thanks, um, Matt, and hopefully we've got some people and all good to go. Uh, so first of all, title, what are the lessons that eSport can learn from high performance sport? Uh, it's pretty broad, uh, a lot of ideas and issues in there, obviously fairly limited time. Um, so we'll look at uh, some areas of that, but it's a relatively generic touch on, on quite a few areas. Um, so let's, let's dive in. If we can get going. One second. There we go. So Simon Cox, that's me. A um, little bit of background. Uh, I'm an ex-athlete. Uh, back in the day, in the 90s, I was a, a world champion uh, in the sport of rowing. Um, I then transitioned into to coaching and ran some of the biggest uh, sort of institutions in the UK, which is where I'm from, and then started to, to move abroad and actually became head coach of the, the Swiss National Federation. Uh, which involves setting up a structure from uh, beginners through to Olympic champions and how to build people through that process. Uh, so it was hands-on coaching as well as structure building um, and establishing a, a pathway to take people effectively from uh, I want to be an Olympic champion age 14 to actually Olympic champions. Uh, so working at all the levels through. Uh, I then moved to Australia also working as head coach, which was a very different setup. They had a very established system already. So that was much more working with a, a very large support structure. And we'll touch a little bit on how you manage that and how you make best use of, of all these available resources that you have. Uh, from there, transitioned into a performance director role, um, actually back in Europe in the Czech Republic, um, still in the sport of rowing. And again, working with a very different culture. Um, the Czech Republic obviously is the next communist state. It's had a lot of political changes and sort of the history of the people working through and how you work with different people, different cultures and get the best from very different situations. Obviously, UK, Switzerland, Australia, Czech Republic are, are different uh, locations, obviously, but, but actually very different cultures and people and, and mindsets and how you work with them. And actually, despite that, have a very common denominator underneath of, of creating a performance. More recently, the last three and a half, four years now, uh, I've been working on eSport. I'm still sort of touching in with some other things, um, but basically in eSport as a performance consultant and actually as an embedded performance director um, in, in some orgs. So that's sort of how I got here. I got into eSport really because, to be honest, got fairly disillusioned with the Olympic model. Um, some very big dreams of, of, of athletes and how that was clashing with the the commercial reality of the Olympics, which is, uh, to me, it's, it's a different conversation, but actually become very commercialized and sponsorship driven and money driven and, and how that was actually matching in with the, the reality of the people's dreams. Um, but that's a money in sport is, is an interesting one and, and how that works. But that's how I, I've got to, to where I am. So now working majority time in, in eSport, but with a background of, of creating Olympic gold medal performances um, and, and structures to build into that. Okay, so diving in, uh, goals and challenges for the next half hour. Um, well, the first one is in the UK and Europe, it's now lunchtime. Um, so I know we've just picked up some of you are actually in, in Los Angeles, so maybe early breakfast, but um, hopefully I can keep you entertained or interested through the next half hour or so as you punch your sandwiches or, or more glamorous lunches, whatever you're up to. Um, and equally, a goal of change is also to, to know your audience. Now, I, I've sort of the way this, these things work is you sort of throw it out and hopefully it touches some some chords and some ideas with your work and how you're working and some of the issues you're you're facing in the different fields that you're in. Um, know your audience is something I'll, I'll come back to, um, but I sort of always go to these conferences and things with the caveat that even if I hear things that I know or I'm doing, actually it's nice reassurance and it's it's good that someone else is as going down the same lines as I am. So hopefully there's some bits in there that we can touch on that will be important or interesting or touch a nerve and very much as ever open to ideas or taking things further uh, at the end. So um, eSport and sport, uh, if we call it the fundamentals, um, I don't think we need to have any discussion about e is eSport a sport and what is sport and what is the difference effectively to me, you have a, a date and a time where you need to create a performance. And whatever you call that, we call it sport or esport. That that's what we're trying to do. Um, that's the aim of the players. I use the players and athletes interchangeably. Uh, the players, the coaches, the org, and, and all the support structure around that. We're trying to create a performance at a certain time on a certain day. 
<laughs> and that's sort of our fundamental. And how I work is breaking things down to really what what is essential to that? What do you really need for that to happen? And something I'll, I'll pick up with is we have a lot of sort of nice to haves as opposed to what do you actually need? Yeah, and we'll, we'll sort of step in and out of that. Common challenges, as I've just described, you know, we are trying to create a performance and our challenge is to create the best performance at that time. Otherwise we underperform. And that's very much you know, that the skill and what we learn and make mistakes with and develop as we go through and players learn and orgs learn and coaches learn um, effectively from experience about how to overcome those challenges. And we'll look at some of those as I go through. And just really to, to finish the introduction, you know, the esport and the discussions that I have with my traditional sporting colleagues and, and friends, you know, esport is incredibly global. It, I mean, it really is truly global. Some of the rosters we put together, you know, you we're not claiming we had a great world peace, but actually they are amazingly global. How you bring the entire globe together with one goal, with one event, with one competition, with a, a unifying game. You, know, you could argue football is global, but not not really in the same way. And to, to be a, a world champion esport player, you really are beating the world. You know, and it, it's 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 very exciting for that, but does create its its own challenges. Okay, so going back to to know your audience. So so this is really key to how I work, and I think one of the areas where in esport we we get um, misaligned. So. When I start a program, whether it's traditional sport or, or esport, it's really understanding who are your athletes players, who are your colleagues, your coaches, your support staff, who is the management, who is the org, and by who it's really this question: what is their why? How strong is their why? What are they actually trying to achieve? Why are they doing it? You now everyone could say, "I want to be Olympic champion. I want to to win the majors." Okay, now is your why strong enough? to actually go through all the, the, the stress, the trauma, the practice, the highs and the lows to get there. And that's something that certainly in traditional sport, there's a, a network and a pathway that's established to sort of weed out things, if you like. But in eSport, uh, I like to use the phrase, you know, it, it, it bypassed puberty. We had a, a, an egg that was born and suddenly boom, it's a global competition. And actually it hasn't had the the advantage, or possibly you could say it wasn't an advantage of actually developing all those layers to create the structure to help people through. So what we quite often find is that we have young players with talent, and then we lose them on the way through because we actually haven't established their, their why as being strong enough. And that actually has to match with the org and the management and the whole structure going through. Um, and by that, we need to look at the alignment, the player goals, the coach goals, the organization goals. If those aren't aligned, we instantly have conflict, we have disappointment, we have problems. So at the very early stages of this, we need to make sure that any new player coming in, any coach that's been hired, any organization you're joining, you, you do have that alignment. Because as we know, if you've got a player who wants to do 14 hours a day and we've got a coach who wants to do three hours a day and we've got an organization who expects to win the major but doesn't want to pay then we have problems we have upset and effectively the default is things kick off on social media and then you're managing problems around that so so that is a i can't overstress how strong that needs to be that we we have a, a real alignment of understanding what the why is and then alignment of these things tied into that we have the time frame how long have you got now, in traditional sport, there's a, a structure of, of the Olympics every four years, but then you, or you have your football world, Champ world Cups, you have your rugby World Cups, you have events that are at peaks. Now, at the moment, in a lot of eSport, there you have your majors, but actually they haven't yet come out at the top. There's kind of too many events to really have a, a peak. So you need to set what are your timeframes to get to those goals that you've aligned. And when those are out of alignment as well, then you have problems in esports generalizing a little but has a very disposable sort of attitude these aren't good enough throw them out get the next ones in these aren't good enough get the next one because the time frame isn't really set uh, and the development and the time frame and the, the ability to actually build rosters and, and stay with them and build them through 
doesn't tend to align with the org and the org needs results to keep sponsors, to keep the, the money coming in effectively, puts pressure on the coach, puts pressure on the players. And then you have this spiral of, of pressure because everything isn't aligned and the timeframes don't fit. So again, it's establishing this. It ties in expectation implications. You know, once you start going down the, the, the line of, if we don't win, then this. Now in traditional sport, Olympic sport particularly, there is actually tremendous pressure that we try and keep off athletes. But if they don't get a medal, effectively, the organization loses its money. Now, that's the organization means everyone from the secretary to the CEO to the coaches to the training camps and everything else. You know, if we use the UK as an example, and Australia is the same, you have a medal tally, a medal target, but if you miss it, the implications are huge. So in the background, you have this pressure of actually being responsible as a player or as an athlete for a, a huge number of, of, of people's livelihoods. Um, now in, in eSport, at the moment, that's relatively separated in that there isn't that level of support structure and the money is, tends to be more commercial as opposed to, to government, which is, is, tends to be the way with the sporting structure. But we need to manage again, timeframes, expectations, implications. And this is all sort of in the, the pot, if you like, of how we create an environment and a structure that can both achieve its maximum potential, but actually keep moving forward without imploding and being pulled apart. That ties into the culture. Um, I saw a little bit of the, the lecture over on, on Channel One and looking at the Korean culture, 14 hours a day solo queue, you know, mixed with, they call it the European culture, is far less. How do you marry those two? If you get it right, you can bring the two together and you get a huge benefit. You get it wrong and you get polarization of them and us and it doesn't work. You know, how do you marry the expectations around what you've got? Um, you know, certainly working in the different countries I've worked in, you cannot transport you know, one system structure straight to another. You have to adjust and, and see who's in front of you. And, and this is perhaps the, the key message from this slide really is understanding their why and dealing with what's in front of you. Who is the player in front of you, not the player you'd like them to imagine. You know, we'd all want to, to coach device or whoever it is in your particular um, game, but actually they bring a different set of problems, but they're not the ones in front of you. You have to coach what you have and get the best from what you have. And it's maximizing that it is the real skill that, that we look at. Conflicts of interest, uh, again, it just ties in really with what we're looking at. If they're not aligned, we have problems. So the, the structure around that, is it fit for purpose? You, know, you, you want to be world champions? Well, okay, you need a structure that's going to build you to that point and everything around that. Do you have the money for that? Do you actually have the facility? Do you have the players for that? Do you have the right level coaching? And again, it's working through these ideas of does it work for what you want? Or are you being blunt? Are you dreaming? You know, okay, we all want to be a world champion, but actually have you got a structure that's fit for purpose? And that's actually where a lot of my work has been um, internationally. It's putting those things in place that people can build through a pathway and a structure to actually get there. How do you know it's fit for purpose? You know, how are you measuring? How are you monitoring? Measurement and monitoring is something that in international sport has been there a, a long time and it has developed. Um, traditional sport has, has had the time to develop that. Actually to measure and monitor is practice good. It, it's very hard in sport. It's relatively new. The players say, well, just let me play. Let me play some more. I just want to play. Now, getting over that to are you playing that it's making you better? How do you know it's better? And I'll come back to that a bit later, but that is a big thing in eSport. That is it. Um, we have some technologies or people, people use the aura rings and, and other ideas around that. Um, but again, the, the structure has to make that valuable. It has to bring value or it becomes a nice to have. And the difference between a nice to have and something that brings value is really key, particularly when money's tight. You know, these things are great, but they're nice to have as opposed to actually that will get me better results. That will get me more training time. That will get me better recovery. Uh, and that's a very important thing to really look at hard or else, you know, I promise you a lot of traditional sports offices have cupboards full of the latest idea that actually mm, were nice to have, but then get put in the cupboard because they detract from other things. Value nice to have creates the environment whereby actually these things are, are working. A pathway is something I alluded to a little bit before. 
does your structure actually bring people through? Can you see that they're getting better? Is there a way to get better? Or is it yes, no, in, out? Um, tends to be at the moment relatively binary in that we don't have the, the time, the space, the capacity. There's some more academy teams now setting up. There's now academies appearing, and that's a, a positive thing. But if you look at a, a traditional model of you, you start at your school, your local community, you'd work to your regional area, regional sort of trials for national, national, you then start to go international. There's, there's some nice stepping stones. That is sort of happening in eSport, but it, it's a development in process. Again, we're, we're stepping back to puberty rather than running on quicker and quicker um, with that. And, and pathways, you know, in traditional sport, if you're not on a pathway somewhere, um, you know, you, you're, you've probably gone wrong. There's all sorts of, of pathways to, to, to find the top talents. Um, this is just a little example of um, when I was working in Australia. Just be careful what you wish for. So this is what was available to me as a head coach. I had a physiologist, a biomechanist, a dietitian, a psychologist, a physiotherapist, strength and conditioning, equipment manager, a manager, assistant coach, you know, all fantastic. This is everything I can call on to help me. But the reality is you actually then have to manage all these things. And of course, they're brilliant. They all have value, but they all want their piece of your player or your athlete because they need to, to justify themselves. They're being paid. You know, which bit of them got you a better performance? So I say, be careful what you wish for because... You, you go down this way and it's, it's it's fantastic, but you then have to manage this whole support structure around your player. So are you then spending more time timetabling all these things, which are fantastic, you know, great, and they're not actually being able to practice. So again, it is stripping back what you really need, you know, in their own right. I can't argue that these are great to have, but you have to be very careful that actually they're adding value to your performance. And that's very key. And you know, we've seen examples of a dietitian, fantastic, you have a dietitian, and then you see the guys afterwards talking about the dietitian as they sit in McDonald's, you know, literally. Um, so it's, you can have them, but they have to have an impact on performance, which you have to be able to measure. And you have to be able to follow through with it. Because what tends to happen is you end up with a tick box exercise of, oh, we saw a dietitian, we've got a great org, but actually, does it change anything? Are they eating better? Are they sleeping better? Are they actually turning up the practice more prepared to practice better or for longer or at a higher intensity, which is what you want? So I, I feel in eSport at the moment, a little bit of ticks box, oh, we've got a mental help, we've got a psychologist, you know, great. But can we actually measure is that having enough impact for the time and cost of doing it? Now, in some cases, definitely. In other cases, I'd, I'd question. So, uh, be careful what you wish for. I mean, we even got to the stage in Australia where um, athletes would arrive at the Olympic Village with, with effectively a personalised mattress. You know, the plane seat, the, the top athletes, we actually did a, there was a study on moulding them to a plane seat so they could sit in a perfectly moulded plane seat on the plane. Now, you, it's kind of laughable, but actually the reality is, as I said before, if these athletes got medals, the organization had money and the organization could then employ everyone here and the cycle continued. If they didn't, then all that came under threat. So is the half percent gain potentially of giving them a comfortable seat on the plane and a good night's sleep worth it? Well, in the end, in Australia, we calculated, yes, it was. Um, but again, you, you have to be very careful effectively where you're spending your money and checking again that you're getting something for it. Nice to have or actually doing something for performance. Justification of cost benefit. Um, what do you really need? I quite like this slide when I, I do talks to traditional um, sporting organizations. And you get the youngsters, yeah, I want to be an Olympic champion. It's okay, you want to be an Olympic champion. And the same now with esport players come. What do you really need? They say, well, I need money and I need a perfect PC and I need a setup and da, 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 da. And it's like, well, hang on, let's just have a little look at that. And what do you actually need? You know, to get fit, you need a pair of running shoes. You, know, you go out and you practice hard. And then when you're doing that, then you can start to layer on. And this is something that's very, um, very important to the way I work is that the player or the athlete 
not so much has to justify, but they have to step forward first, then you support. They step forward first, then you support. And it, it goes together as opposed to what tends to start with now is a hand goes out, give me everything, and then I'll give you a performance. So you start to have the discussion. No, okay, if I double your money, can you move your mouse quicker? Can you actually press the keys quicker? Will you hit more shots with double the money? If so, why? You know, what is what is actually the relationship between that and your performance? And it is a balance. Um, it's obviously not blackmail, but it doesn't help. But it's really key that as we start to have more things available, they are justified. I know esport players have got good, and we're looking at them as professionals because they've done this. They've got the equivalent of their muddy running shoes on and practice hard, usually by themselves, uh, in an environment where they've just worked hard. Now, what we have to keep is, is that background of, yes, they do the work and we support that but we can't do it for them. And once you start adding ideas and everything else, the traditional sport has really learned this lesson um, with that. Performance gains. I know all the things we've talked about, and it, it's, it's, it's fun, it's glamorous, it's great fun, is chasing the half percent. You know, how do we get that tiny performance gain? You know, if we adjust the height of the desk half a centimetre, because we've had the ergonomist in, I think we can get half percent more out of them. Well, that's great, and yes, very definitely. But actually, it's really key you secure the 95% first. And it's not a very glamorous message, it's not very exciting, but actually you have to get the fundamentals done. And again, it's, it's aligning who you've got, what their goals are, and how they're on that pathway. You know, if you're chasing the half percent with a player who's struggling to do three hours practice a day because they've got these other things, it's not worth it. it. Might be nice. I need a dietitian. It's like, well, okay, first stop getting up and having Red Bull, Red Bull for breakfast. You know, let's start there. You know, eat a banana, and these really basic things that actually are going to get you the the relatively low hanging fruit, as we call it, ninety five percent, as opposed to the the high cost and relatively small impact of the half percent. Now, of course, the half percent, when you're talking really high performance, getting the last half percent is the hardest bit and takes the most time and the most energy and everything else. But you have to get there before it actually has value. And that's a, a message that many athletes and, and players don't want to hear because they, they want the, the bells and the whistles. But to get to the bells and whistles, boom, you've got to be doing the basics. And once you lose the basics, it, it, it's basically over. Big question is how do we know, you know, whether they're getting better? Are they doing the basics? And at what point do we start bringing that? Now, in traditional sport, we have it's different words, but basically we have a world's best time or a, a gold medal time or, or, or a, a target that we know that if we can work out a percentage to that, then we know where we are. So if you like a runner, we'll do a certain amount every week at 60, 70% world best time. And then they'll move on um, to 20% of, sort of 70, 80% and a little bit of, of 90 to 100%. You know, it, 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 you're working at a training program relative to a number. Now, in eSport, we don't really have that. We, we've got a bit of capacity to, to look at it um, and develop it. Is it a you know, kill-death ratio? Is it hours you play? Um, is it an intensity? How do you measure intensity in eSport? There's... A, a quite a big area here where people are evolving it and working out how to do it but it's certainly something i and my colleague actually brought into esport is this idea of, of how do you measure um in a traditional sport we have a lot of measurement and when we started certainly players were very very against it they didn't like it they didn't like being measured oh i'll just play um so we had to get the athlete player buy-in they we, we turned it around and said okay will you show me in your game how you know you're getting better you're doing all these hours of practice how are you getting better what should i measure and once you get them to actually sort of say okay well if i can do this then you'll see that's better okay well let's measure that and then you start a process whereby they're actually engaged in that themselves and it's far more effective than management coming in and going, this number isn't good this week, or it's all the problem. And then you get an excuse culture and then you get a but, 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 and it's his and it's my role. And if I do this and that, you say, okay, well, you tell me how you know you're getting better. And it actually worked very well. Um, and it stopped this feeling, this threat 
of all oh, my numbers are down. And then, of course, as we know, they start to play differently to make sure their numbers are OK, um, which is, is the worst case scenario rather than actually practice more freely. So that was how we worked that. But actually, as coaches and performance directors or the orgs, you know, how do you measure um, in eSport it is an interesting one because obviously every game is different. Um, there's, there's different ideas in there, and, and that is a, an interesting one to actually to, to look through. I was with the training programs um, and, and follows on from that idea. In the traditional sport, we have periodization, whereby you're looking to create a peak for your biggest event. Now, what we have is being able to play with volume, intensity, and recovery. And those are sort of your three key players, your three key levers. Now, in eSport, um, volume is relatively easy. It's just how many hours you play. Um, intensity is, is, is a trickier one in that what is a more intense game as opposed to an easy game? Um, so what we've done is actually try and very basic level, put in, call it a, a green, yellow, and red scrim. Um, in the various different games, how that works. Uh, a red is a, com uh, a competitive one, whereby you're just playing to win. You just, you have to win. A green one at the other end is just a practice where you're trying things out, you're learning. And an orange one is you're practicing, you're learning. Now, what we try and do is just look at percentage wins in the red one, in that that then creates a, a level of, this is how much you're winning when we're saying you have to. And what we try and do is take away the pressure on the, the other ones, if you like, the green and the orange, that they're learning environments. So we, we relatively don't monitor those. But then, of course, with your red ones, you're playing a top 10 team, a top 5 team, a top 30 team. So you then have to balance that out to, to create something. And then you start to see a, a pattern and a repeatable pattern um, that actually you, you can work through. So intensity in, in eSport is tricky. Um, but the goal, of course, is, is to see what volume you can create at the correct intensity for what you're trying to achieve. Um, if you're looking to just expand the capacity to play longer, well, obviously, you, you step through that volume, but then you need to watch at the level they're playing. If you're looking for intensity, intensity quality is sort of interchangeable. You can play around with that. I know your, your goal is to be able to play you know, five games in a, in, in a lot of genres. Um, at high intensity. So if you only ever practice three, you know, when you get hit with five, you're going to be in trouble. So it, again, it, it's, it's not rocket science. You're playing with these ideas of intensity, quality, volume. And um, one of the areas that actually was the, not, not a surprise as such, but was sort of the trickiest to, to look at was, was recovery. Um, you know, you, you say to a traditional uh, sporting person, you know, okay, you've got a day off. What are you going to do? Well, I'll go and do something different. I'll have a football, I'll go and play golf or you know, I'll, um, whatever. You actually give the, the muscles that you've been working a, a rest. You say to an eSport player, well, I want you to have a day off. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to go and play my game um, because that's what they like doing. That, that is their, their release. That is the area they go in. So actually finding a, a way to, to get good recovery in eSport players is, is tricky. Um, I was colleagues in, in China and traditional sport was quite tricky in that the way they play their athletes over there is for when they're training. So you actually had to put in their training program a, a recovery block or else they wouldn't be paid for it. So you literally put recovery reading book um, was how that worked. And in some ways, esports similarly, you almost need to put in something that, that stimulates them in a different way away from the games. We, we know that stimulation of the blue screen and everything, and it ties them in, the body posture, the whole action the interaction but that's their way of recovery you know that is an off day i'll play with my friends i'll, I'll you know i'll mess around so, so that's something that, that's quite um tricky that so haven't really cracked that well yet and that you can you know, that's how they relax so you can't take that away but you have to be able to model it so that it does actually become recovery because the, the easiest thing on training programs is, is to push hard you know anyone can do it you bang out the hardest program you can, and you just break them. Well, it's, it's easy. But the trickiest bit is knowing how to pull back and when to pull back. And it's that reading of how to push and come back, how to push and come back. Because at, at high performance, and we're talking proper high performance, you, you, what you're looking for is that edge. And that's why you have the support structure of physios and psychologists and everything else, is basically as a coach, how far on can you push them into that edge without breaking? Now, this is talking very, you know, the very pointy end of high performance. It's, it's many ways not nice. Um, 
it, it, it's right on the edge and, and sometimes you get it wrong and, and people break and, and that's you know it, it's not good it's not right but, but that is the nature of, of actually where you're getting to it again at the very top end um and there's a lot of underneath that that people think is high performance and everything else but i'd argue is it really um and, and there is a difference you you have to really see that you know the world champion that the best of the best is working and the people around that at, at a, a different sort of level you know you're always at that one one step away from it all going very wrong and how you manage that is actually the skill of the performance director and the coach and, and working again with those alignments and the staff around them um what we're aiming for in training programs is had a peak and again in esports there tend to be a lot of peaks and it's up to, to you and the org to actually work out how to how to create that peak at the moment you you want to and it, it's quite fun you, you get it wrong you speak to the, the players okay actually we felt good we didn't and, and you create a sort of learning through that using your your three basic levers volume intensity quality and, and recovery how to recover and push as we just talked about um, and again it is the recovery that's the skill um, and, and what you're doing there there's a uh, a famous uh, East German coach um, who came to, to coach rowing in the UK. Uh, he's won a gold medal at every Olympics since 1972 up to, to Tokyo, where he, he wasn't actually coaching. Um, incredible, successful. He, there's some controversy around his, his methods, which were very direct, if I put it that way. Um, but in terms of training program, he was relatively open. You could get his training program because he knew it, it's not the words on the page. It's what you do with them. And again, this is a, another thing. It, it's easy to, to to read the books and everything else, but it's how you put that into practice. You know, your interaction day to day, your your personal um, relationship with your players, with the org, how you actually put these things really into practice and make them work. Um, you know, we could all get the the gold medal training program, but I can guarantee you, there's only one person who could actually translate those words into the quality that was needed in the training on a day to day basis. Planning again. This is how to peak. You know, what are your priorities and sticking to those. You know, actually, this is our plan. This is how we're going to work through. Great, and sticking to them, but by being nimble around it. You know, um, you have to recognise again what's in front of you. you know, the stress, the tiredness, the cognitive load. Your cognitive load is is obviously pretty key in esport, but it's actually very tricky to measure. It's very individual. And it's, it's, if you like, you know, people aren't tired physically per se, but they get very tired. And measuring that is something we're looking at. The travel, content, social media, and results. These are the three sort of biggest things, if we like, that add on the extra stress and can tip people over the edge. You know, travel actually is tiring for people. And the youngsters, sometimes the first time they've been away from home, and particularly with the whole COVID break, you know, these people have come through, through that, that period, now suddenly they're traveling again to, to events, planes, the whole package. Um, you know, it is very tiring. We have to recognize that pressure results we talked about before and how you, you layer these things into your program. Um, obviously, you know, training programs is a, is a huge topic in itself. And that's just sort of looking a little bit in some of the challenges we have in eSport of, of how to actually put a training program together. Real life issues. I know we'll stick it in there. People are they have lives, you know, the whole package and anything and everything that, that happens around that. So training step by step, we like to do, and I'm sure you've seen some of these before. Step one, learn to train, train to train, train to compete, compete to win. And really getting these easy to say points into the right order and actually working through them is really key. You know, and then your alignment of expectations and goals start to come into focus. Excuse me. You know, it's quite a nice one to actually see where your players are and the org as well. You know, where does it sit in that? Um, you get a player who's, who's good, but actually, do they know how to train? It, it is different to just playing with your mates. You know? Can they turn up on time? Literally, you know, start with the very basics. We expect training to start at this time. You know, your first day one of being a pro, you are now paid. It's a very different environment because you now have a responsibility to actually turn up on time. You know, there is an expectation. 
And then how do you use that time? You know, how do you teach a player to have a debrief? Um, it's the same the world over. You know, you ask a player, you ask an athlete a question. You know, how do you actually get them to say something that, that's then useful, that then doesn't upset the rest of the roster? They learn to speak in a way that is respectful, but useful. Uh, we have a bit of a, a game, we've got a switch on, switch off. You know, in game, they can be honest. They have to be honest. You know, if someone does something wrong, then there's that phase of actually hard, fast learning. But then they come out of that and they switch off and it's a different environment. And how to learn to do that. Um, you know, it takes skill um, to do that. And then actually training as you work through to compete and then actually competing to win. You know, these are all steps. And and winning is is different. You know, it's much easier to, to do well. It, it's, it gives you a, a safety net to actually stick your head out and win. You know, takes another step. Um, and those are all all layers that we have to take traditional and esport players through. So <clears throat> really just a reality check. You know, we all like performance and high performance, and it's very glamorous, easy word these days, and everyone's doing high performance. You know, my job titles are the, are the same. But we have to be careful that when we talk about high performance, you know, is it really? Um, you know, it, it's actually... Uh, it's a little bit of a freak show you know you are looking at the one percenters of, of the globe you're getting the, the real best of the best you know genetically they're out there they don't fit your typical bell curve you know they are the outliers now that is really high performance so you go to the olympics and and it is pretty much a, a freak show of extraordinary um humanity from your your gymnast your basketball player you know that is humanity writ large in two very different forms and absolutely exceptional at what they can do with what they have so we have to be careful that we don't start putting high performance on people or players and organizations that aren't actually there that's not a bad thing it just means we need to recognize it and work through it um, because when you do really work with, with very high performance you know the the, the biggest physiologies in the world, the, the biggest lung capacities, you know, the best of the best. It, it's very challenging to everybody because, as I said before, things can be on such a, such a knife edge between you know, performance that is incredible and failure. And it's a, it's a tough place to work. It sounds glamorous, but it, it's very tough. And we, we have to recognize that and, and enjoy it for that. Um, but it, it's important we, we don't start loading up players or orgs that aren't actually there yet it's not saying they, they can't build and get there to the expectations of everything um, you know you start loading high performance on people who aren't ready and it, it kills it it's a disaster you know what do you mean i have to do this i just want to play my game it's okay well you want to play a game now let's start to build these things through on a pathway to actually take you through to high performance um with that but the other thing it is untidy you know Proper high performance, it, it's not formulaic. You're constantly dealing with, with issues. You know, as again, it, it's, it's that knife edge of it's working, not working. You push, come back, push, come back, it breaks, get it back. And it's pretty ruthless and brutal. Um, you know, it, it's, it, it's right there at the pointy end, as I said. And I think you have to be ready to embrace that untidiness and make it work somehow, um, you know, because that's how it is. And it's it's a real line of success or failure um, with that top end. And ruthless and brutal is, is a word I use quite a lot. You know, esport can be very brutal, um, not least because you get such a an outpouring of, of social media if, if things don't go well and everything else. And how you pick up the pieces from that and your support structure around that is very key. But I think don't be afraid of the untidiness. You know, yes, you have your structure, yes, you you have your systems, but actually if it needs to work um it needs to work and that's what i call remove the barriers you know actually what's stopping the performance as opposed to can we add all these things to make it better if you start by taking away the, the problems if you like you know why can't you turn up on time why can't you eat properly why aren't you sleeping better so take these things away then it's it's a much easier um step through with that um and maximizing the good hours and days you know a coach and the player working together actually improving the performance you know, how many hours in your day in your week can you build for that so as a performance director that is your goal 
that is the goal of all the support structure is to maximize the, the good hours and days and weeks. And that's how you improve performance. And once you lose that primary goal, you know, if you can't get that to work, it's never going to work. And, and the number of things that get in the way of that are just you know, exponential. You know, there's always a reason why. You know, it's classic. You select your new roster. It's all exciting. And I can guarantee you day one, someone will be ill and you have to get the sub in. You know, someone's PC breaks. And you, you know, it's, it's always a, an issue there. So maximizing the, the good hours and days of, of coach to player time it is what it's all about because then you start to be able to see your performance gains. Then you're getting good coaching, then you're getting the interaction, and then you're building. But the number of, of days, hours, time, whatever, that, that actually stop that happening it, it is, you know, it is amazing. But the black book of, of reasons that, that things couldn't work, it goes on and on. And, and I quite like this was a, a Olympic gold medalist friend of mine who I worked with in, in Switzerland. He had this, this nice frame. Um, you know, we have a, a system that can bend but not break. You know, we're dealing with young people, basically, and they like to push. They like to you know what happens if, how far can I go? Now, if we have a rigid structure, particularly if we're talking proper high performance, it won't fit the outliers. So yes, we have to we have to be able to bend with that, but not break. We we can't lose our fundamentals, and what your fundamentals are is really key to how your organisation works. You know what are your effectively non-negotiables and how far. Will you negotiate them to keep your star happy? And at what point do you say no to your star? And they threaten to walk. Well, okay, is the org bigger than the star? In the end, I would always say yes um, around that. Um, that's really, excuse me. Um, but, but that is something certainly that we need to keep a very close eye on. How, how do you work that? And it's quite a nice phrase. You know, can your system bend but not break? So to end at the start, um, we talked about aligning your fundamentals, and, and that's really key. What are they, and, and how do you actually fit them all the way through your organization? And I, I couldn't think of a cheesy line to put it together, but basically, in esport, what you have to do, the challenge is to make your fundamentals fun, and that's really key. Um, how do you keep that entertainment value, that, that sense of we're playing our game? whilst putting all this, if you like, serious structure and expectations and performance models and everything else around it. Because at its core, you know, we're playing games and creating that environment of, of fun whilst keeping that performance push underneath it, it is a real skill. Um, and I'll be honest, it was something I, I was probably too serious with, but actually I found a way to make it work. Um, and, and it's not easy. And, and that's what the best coaches can do. You know, they make you train harder and better without you really realizing it because it's you know, all for that fun word. You're engaged in, in that environment. And that's when you get a coach, you can do that. You've got to hang on to them because that's a, a real skill. It's a person skill and it's that's real coaching. Um, with that. All right. Um, so that's whistle stop tour through a lot of different ideas, a lot of thoughts in there. Um, very happy to take questions and, and thoughts around that. Um, it, it's pretty generic and I'm very happy to dive into more things, but hopefully there are a few key key points in there that, that sort of hit a chord. Perfect. Thank you, Simon. That was that was an amazing talk. I really, really enjoyed um, listening to that. And there's a lot of small things there that I can instantly put into my coaching practice. Um, just, just being aware of time, we have a couple questions, but I'll hit you in one now, and then we'll, I'll post the next one into the Discord so you can reply back to that um, how, how you see fit. So a question by, by Dombey here was, what would you recommend to coaches who sometimes have to fight for job security in off-season? A bit of background to this question is, as coaches, they always find themselves or often find themselves in a situation where their time frames don't align with an organization, where organizations look for short-term success. As we know in coaching, we like to have a more long-term project in our hands. Um, and obviously with esports having this vulnerable and volatile economic situation, and you can't always be very picky, how, what would you suggest to coaches who are trying to align themselves as a coach with their organization and aligning the whys of, of a long-term versus short-term project? Um, in the end, it's, it's, it's a tough one, and we all face it to well, you know, in every sport and everywhere. Um, a slightly cheat answer is to look for a short-term win. 
what's your low hanging fruit? Can you give the org something that you can say, okay, here we go, we, we've got this. And sometimes it could be the expense of, of something, but if you can minimize that, then it, it's worth it. So relatively pick a, you know, if it, it's picking an event that you know you can do well in, it's picking a, a lower level that you perhaps should be in, but they, they've got something. If, if you can say, okay, if there, there's a, a get, get the early, the early goal, if you like, and that gives you a, a moment to breathe and reestablish yourself. Um, you know, it's, it's of course easier said than done, but it, it's, 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 you're exactly right. You know, we create as a coach, a, an idea and a structure going through, okay, this is how I see myself building and the org goes, boom, it's too slow. I need a win. Um, so if you can find that win somewhere, even if you know, it's actually pretty low value, but okay, this is the media world. We can jazz it up and make it great and, and get that. Um, so that's one side of it. The other side is to make sure that your social media presence, your content stuff is, is big, because that gives another uh, another arrow to your bow, if you like, of a reason to keep the, the roster and the, the core around it. So I, I'm not terribly comfortable in that space, but in, in eSport, you, you have to engage with that as part of being the pro as a coach is how you, you generate that, that extra side to your, your skills. Um, uh, and I think in many ways, when you, it's easy again to say, but when you take the role, it's being pretty honest with the org. Okay, if they're, you know, they're on a, whatever, paying players $250, they've got $250 players, and that, that will mean this. They've got $30,000 players, that will mean this. And, and again, it's, it's getting that conversation early enough. Obviously, cognizant of that, the, you, know, you want the job, so you, you can't shoot yourself in the foot too much, but it's creating that reality. And I think also setting out very clearly how you're going to, to get to their goals and what they need to do that. Um, you know, if you've got a picture, effectively people backing these orgs, you know, are, are successful business people. They've seen business plans. They've seen how that works. So I think you have to get into that mindset of this is a business. You know, what are my KPIs? to get to the goal, the sporting goal you want. Now, as a coach, that's, uh, what do you mean? I need to coach the guys. Like, okay, well, as I was saying in the some of the slides there, you know, what are your markers? What are your touch points? Okay, I can go back and show them. Actually, you know, the players have improved this much and this is their social media content and this is this. So, so it's sort of trying to give yourself more areas where you can hang in there to keep your job to do your coaching bit. Um, it's, it's certainly not an easy one to answer and it's a position as coaches we've all been in um you know I, I, how do i justify myself i haven't got a result because you know it was some, a lot of reasons why not um so it's, it's finding that, that that early you know if you can get a trophy or, or something in there that can show okay we've improved 50 places we, we've got this in, in, in there around that yeah i mean it's hopefully something that improves as, as coaches improve and also as the industry improves. But I, I completely agree that there's more to it and there's a lot of nuance to it. Unfortunately, we do have two other questions. I have um, for you, Simon, um, put it in our question submission forum and in the Discord server. So feel free to I'll just- find you there if I can. <laughs> if I don't, please feel free to email me if I haven't got back to you on, on that. But, um, if you get into that. But yeah, as, um, as uh, Simon's, uh, flagged up there at the bottom is his email so if you have any questions and if 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 some of you guys are watching this in the future please by all means reach out to simon and, and he'll try your best try his best to get back to you great no problem um oh we've got matt back as well i right, take it all your time matt how are you doing <laughs> no good i've been making notes frantically a couple of things way back at the beginning about alignment that i would love to rack your brains about um just the process of finding alignment i think does that involve like a quick chat or is that something more lengthy but i feel like yeah kavir is trying to <laughs> keep us on schedule so it's, no, it's, it's quick answer it's, it's both isn't it it's that cup of coffee we call it water cooler conversation where you you pick up the vibe and then it's effectively to be honest getting to the ceo if you can get the top man aligned to it then you've got that we're talking about sort of security if you like of coaching job if the top guy knows then you've got that and one of the ways is to get them to the coal face get them down to a session to actually really understand you know, what you're facing uh, and that you know the generalized but the ceos love it you know get them in the chair get them messy uh, get them sweaty uh, and then they start to engage with the players or oh, how do you what do you uh, and then you've got that you know uh, and then you've, you've got you've got a friend in high places if you like um yeah 
is always handy. And actually, also a fantastic segue because I think we're, we're going to touch very, very briefly on how coaching can be a, a almost a response to what what players need. And if your CEO comes down and experiences even for a, a short while what what the players are experiencing, what their needs might be, it probably makes it all the easier to to go to them and say, "Look, we need some more resources in this area or or some other one." So, yeah, I mean, wonderful. Uh, picture there and player centered player led coach led where you want to go right but anyway that's a different conversation yeah another minefield <laughs> fantastic well thanks yeah. that was, uh, that was yeah. enriching um so what sorry everybody it, should i go over to discord and check in there or how does these other questions coming in what, what's best on, on that so in the in the discord channel there's that um there's a question submission channel and there's a forum titled under your name. So feel free to reply to those there. Um, and when we have a break after the next round of conversations, there's gonna be a 10 minute break. Feel free to just jump into a voice channel uh, and, and ping people if, if you wanna have a, if you wanna talk to them about it and go into more depth. All right, good luck this afternoon, Matt. And um, great. Good awake and, and up and running. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, hopefully my power is still on. That's the that's the big question of the day. Anyway, uh, okay then, Simon, I'm not sure if I can demote you back to a... Is it best if I leave and come back? Is that probably best that you start a new page? Yeah, that might do it. Do you mind? <laughs> I don't worry. <laughs> How ungracious. <laughs>